You know, Peter, several sources now claim that over 20 million homes are vacant. That's when you include condos, apartments, duplexes, and houses. Clearly, the recession has convinced millions to move back home or to share residential dwellings with others. Do you see this trend continuing? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I think that rents are still going to fall, even in an inflationary environment, because, you know, we have so many houses uh, the question is, you know, you can have two or three families sharing a house. I mean, right now, uh, during the housing boom, we overbuilt houses. And so, you know, there are plenty of people, you know, living in houses all by themselves. I mean, plenty of single men and women in their 20s were buying condos or buying small homes or, you know, townhouses where they don't need that. I mean, they could certainly have a roommate and share an apartment. Uh, they don't need to have their own little townhome. Uh, So I think a lot of people are going to be doing that. I think younger kids in their early 20s might move in with their parents, save some money, get their own room back. Uh, Maybe some of the elderly parents, you know, will sell their house and move in with their grown kids who might have, you know, a spare bedroom now that their kids are are off uh, to college or off on their own. Uh, So I think households are going to be destroyed as people are looking for ways to cut back on expenditures and, and, and save money. And so the result is going to be landlords are just going to have to keep uh, lowering rents in order to to avoid that. Uh, but there's, there's lots of properties that are that are empty. I mean, in my area, there are so many homes that are for sale. There are so many new homes that have been built over the past two or three years that have never been occupied by anybody. And a lot of the people are reluctant to rent out the new home because then it's no longer the new home. It's now been lived in. They want to keep it, you know, brand new. No one's ever lived here. Uh, and so there's plenty of vacant uh, homes. There's lots of vacant condos. I mean, they're all over the place. The tradition- Traditional mortgage valuations, they were clearly tossed out the window during the bubble years. Instead of that three times annual household income, these toxic mortgage we've talked about and lax lending standards encouraged millions to accept loans of much more than three times. People were buying up to, you know, getting loans 10 times their income. In fact, in some cases, you don't even know because you didn't even have to disclose your income if you went for a liar's loan, buying homes without any income. I mean, up to nine, ten times, as you say, it's particularly in Southern California. But what I want to know, Peter, is what metrics are you watching for? What are you telling your friends and family to look out for and to know when it's time to buy a house again? I mean, you have to look at a house. Is it you're talking about? Is it a financial decision or is it a you know a, a lifestyle decision? I mean, everybody needs to live somewhere. The question is, do you rent or do you buy? And you have to look at what makes sense for you. I mean, obviously, if you're thinking about housing as an investment, don't even consider it. I mean, if, if, if you're motivated by money, if you're, if you're going to buy a house because you think you're going to make money on it, don't even think about doing that. I mean, there are so many better things to put places to invest your money. You know, you don't buy, don't buy a house as an investment. But if you're trying to figure out, I'm going to spend money on living, right? So do I want to spend money on rent? Or do I want to spend money on on interest and property taxes and and maintenance and depreciation? I mean, what do you want to do? And you also have to look at, you know, what is available to you. Can you rent the kind of property that you want to own? Is it available for rent? I mean, you have to look at what's on the market, what is rentable and what's not. I mean, you know, there could be a great house that's for sale, but the guy will refuse to rent it to you. There's no reason to buy a condo, all right? I mean, pretty much, if you want to live in that type of lifestyle, if you want to live in a a one or two or three bedroom apartment slash condo, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Just rent. But... As far as single-family houses, it's going to depend on the area, what's available for rent. You know, what about you? I mean, you you might not be able to get a long-term lease. I mean, if you're renting, you have to be willing to move frequently if the owner ends up finding a buyer. So, how how, you know how important is it to you for convenience? I mean, are you willing to pay extra to buy a house so you don't have to keep moving? Or you know, do you want to do you want to paint it the way you want? Do you want to do you want to decorate it the way you want? Do you want to knock out a wall? I mean, do you want to do things? You know, that's that's all that is part of it. But one of the things that I would definitely look at if I was buying a house, and you can look at you can compare the rents that you'd have to pay on a house versus the mortgage payment. Is interest rates are very low right now, and they're not going to stay low forever. So the fact that you know, if you buy a house, if you can still do it with a low down payment, it's not really your money that you're using to buy it. You're using someone else's money. And if I'm right on massive inflation, you know, and, and you've borrowed a lot of money, then, you know, it could be a, a, a wise thing to do, given that when, when you start to pay back that loan, you know, 10, 20 years in the future, the payments that you're making are very low with just for inflation. But, you know, Peter, I've heard that argument, and it makes me a bit nervous because when you talk about locking in these low interest rates, but what happens as those rates adjust higher? The mortgage that you purchased... Oh, the house will go down in value. but the thing, Right, but the question is... Even if the house goes down in value, 
it still might have it still might be cheaper for you. Let's say you know based on what your payment is, it still might because you didn't have to actually put down a lot of money. You only put down. Let's say you buy a five hundred thousand dollars house and you put down five percent. So you put twenty five thousand dollars down, and you've locked in these low payments. Even if that house goes down to two hundred fifty thousand, but then mortgage mortgage rates triple. If someone were to buy the house for the lower amount of money, their monthly payment could be a lot higher than yours. The problem is, if you overpay, right, this is the one negative, if you think that there's a chance that you're not going to stay there for a long, for a long time, then it might not work. Because then, you, obviously, you can't sell the property if you pay the high price. I mean, I, you know, it's better to buy the property at a low price and have a higher mortgage payment because you're, you're, you, you have a less, less amount of debt that you have to deal with. But, you know, you can also think about, well, if my mortgage payment is low enough, I can always rent it out. I mean, let's say there's massive inflation. Let's say there's hyperinflation, and your monthly mortgage payment is $2,000 a month, but $2,000 a month is how much it costs to buy a carton, a package of cigarettes. Ultimately, right, that's really cheap. Even if you don't live there, you can rent it out to somebody and keep making that really low mortgage payment. I want to get to this hyperinflation, deflation debate in a moment. Before we do, the nadir in the Case-Shiller Index medium home price, somewhere around, let's say, 32%, 33% on the 10 and 20 city indexes. Recently, we've bounced back. My question to you is, are you in agreement with many of these folks, including uh, Robert Schiller himself, that we could still see a 10 or 20% continuation on the downside after these tax credits pass in the next year or two? Oh, I mean, sure. I mean, there's, I mean, there's not, no indication that the housing market has put in a long-term bottom. Remember, markets always, you know, zigzag patterns. They don't go straight down. They go down, then they go up a little bit, then they go down, and they go up a little bit. And certainly, with all the money that the government has thrown into the housing market, they have been able to arrest the decline, and they've been able to temporarily move prices in, in an upward direction. But this overwhelming supply and demand imbalance is going to force prices lower, especially when you consider the fact that over the last year or two, because of all these extra incentives, we have actually still been constructing homes. Despite the fact that there is a glut of homes, they're still building new ones. That would have stopped. Had the government not been subsidizing the housing industry, there would have been no new houses built in the last year. But because they're subsidizing it, we're actually adding to a saturated market. Meantime, more and more people are now unemployed. The country is in worse shape. So we have more houses and fewer people who can afford them. So it, the situation is just deteriorating. 